So in part one of our interstellar starship video, we made a thought experiment and were thinking about what kind of drive system starship would need to have in order to be able to reach other star systems, such as Proxima Centauri. In this video today, we'll think about how the starship will actually need to be designed and what other features it needs to have for that long interstellar voyage to the nearest star system. This might be quite fascinating, so stay tuned. In the first part of our interstellar starship thought experiment, we found that a future interstellar starship of the year 2100 or even later will need to either employ a fusion drive or a solar cell. We found the other propulsion method to be either not fast enough, not being able to reach 10% the speed of light, such as for example the pulse fission rocket, or not practical enough yet, such as the matter-antimatter drive which would require vast amounts of antimatter, which we simply cannot produce as of now. Hopefully one day, but not yet. And the other even more futuristic concepts, like a Kubeir warp drive, black hole drive or wormhole drive are just too far out, and currently we don't know if they would even work. So that really currently only leaves us with the fusion drive, where nuclear cores fuse together and so create large amounts of energy. And this would need to be a neutronic fusion, such as for example the helium-3 fusion, because the neutrons would just take away too much of the kinetic energy and thus reduce the maximum speed which Starship can attain. With a fusion drive, we might be able to reach 10-12% to 12 the speed of light, which is really not so bad. The other realistic concept would be a giant solar cell. With Project Breakthrough Starshot, this technology will be tested by sending a small solar cell probe to Alpha Centauri. The necessary energy will be transmitted from a high-power phase laser array on the ground on Earth. This beam will then be directed towards the solar cell and so be able to accelerate the cell to up to 20% the speed of light. Ok, so let's then imagine two future starship designs. One based on fusion, the other one based on solar cell. One. Light sail starship. Building a small light sail probe and sending it to Alpha Centauri will already pose quite the technical challenge. Even that small light sail with a dimension of 4 times 4 meters will already need a 100 gigawatt laser array on Earth in order to accelerate it to 20% the speed of light. Such a small light sail would weigh only 1 gram and would be accelerated insanely fast with a peak acceleration of 50,000 Gs. This certainly wouldn't work for a spaceship with humans, of course. The manned light sail starship would of course be much larger and thus also would need to employ a much larger sail. An astronomer called Alberto Cavallero has written a pretty nice paper on the design of how such an interstellar manned light sail spaceship would need to look. We put the link into the description. This interstellar spacecraft would employ a quadratic light sail with a 1 mile edge length. A 300 metric ton spacecraft with a crew of 4 would be attached to the light sail as visualized in these renderings here. Since the spacecraft is a lot larger and thus heavier than the small breakthrough starshot light sail, we would accordingly need a much more powerful laser array to accelerate the craft. Caballero does some calculations and comes to the conclusion that a 26 terawatt laser array would be needed, so an insane 260 times the 100 gigawatt array which will be necessary for the breakthrough starshot project. In addition, we would need to keep the light beam focused, so a really huge parabolic mirror of 137 km diameter would be needed to focus the light beam. He calculates that the resulting force from the laser array onto the light sail would be 173.345 kN, which would yield with a mass of 300 tons of the spacecraft and Newton's law F is m times a, an acceleration of 0.57 meters over second squared. The maximum velocity would be 30% the speed of light, which the spaceship would reach after 4.9 years. But how would this spacecraft then decelerate? Because you know that is the problem. The spacecraft uh, needs to decelerate, else it will just shoot by all the planets in the target star system with 30% the speed of light which uh, wouldn't be so good for the crew of course. 
So what do we do then? Well, Caballero suggests using a combination of a large collector, a so-called Bassard scoop, then a fusion reactor and a high-power laser for deceleration. So how this would work is that a large Bassard scoop would collect interstellar material, feed it to the fusion reactor, which would then power the one terawatt laser, which would decelerate the spacecraft. Before deceleration, the spacecraft would shed the light cell in order to reduce mass, and thus the light cell starship would need 4.75 years to decelerate with 0.6 meter per second square before arriving at the target star system. With this design, a voyage to Alpha Centauri would be possible in 19 years, according to the author. We have to say that this is a highly interesting plan. However, we do see some major problems. First of all, the giant power of 26 terawatts, which the laser array would need to produce continuously for 4.9 years during acceleration. Then the huge parabolic mirror of 137 km diameter is really insane in itself. Then the spacecraft is really quite small for a 19-year trip duration with only 300 metric tons of weight, including Bassard scoop, habitat module, fusion reactor, and deceleration laser. There wouldn't be too much space for the interstellar voyagers on this spacecraft. Some form of cryogenic sleep during the trip would be necessary. Then the author is really vague on the dimensions of the Bassard scoop, and if there would be enough interstellar material to power a CNO cycle fusion reactor. Because for proton fusion, the scoop would need to have a diameter of 63 kilometers, which is not feasible. Also, another major problem is that a return trip wouldn't be possible. There won't be enough energy and resources to build a huge laser array at Alpha Centauri. And a crew size of 4 is way too small for a colony ship. So the solar cell design has some flaws, although we have to say that we still like it somehow. But realistically, we will need a self-powered starship. And since we have established that matter-antimatter reactors are still quite far away, since we just can't produce enough antimatter, we will have to make use of a fusion reactor. 2. Fusion-powered generational starship Realistically, a starship that will embark on a voyage to the Alpha Centauri or Proxima Centauri system will be a generational starship. In the first part of our Starship to Proxima Centauri video series, we have established that a fusion reactor would achieve 10-12% to the speed of light as maximum velocity. Project Daedalus, a study conducted between 1973 and 1978 by the British Interplanetary Society, suggested the use of a 45,000 metric ton spacecraft which would employ the deuterium-helium-3 fusion chain. The spacecraft, as you can see, would be very large and have huge fuel tanks. In fact, 92.6% of the spacecraft's mass would be fuel. The spacecraft was envisioned to be unmanned and fly to Barnard's star, a small M-type red dwarf star 5.9 light years away from us. The voyage would have taken around 50 years. In order to protect from collisions with micrometeorites, two systems would have been employed. One would be a 7mm thin beryllium disc weighing up to 50 metric tons. Another system would be an artificially generated cloud of particles ejected by a fleet of small support vehicles around 200 kilometers in front of the spacecraft. This would disperse incoming particles and micrometeorites enough in theory as to avoid collision with the starship. There are a few things we like more about this vehicle design compared to the light sail. You could scale this up and make it larger in order to build a colony ship. And for a return trip, you would just need to harvest deuterium and helium-3, which might be available in large enough quantities in the target star systems. You would not need to build a huge laser system for a return trip, as in the case of the light sail. But the data loop space probe would be unmanned. So how could we imagine an interstellar starship with human passengers? Well, for that, we probably would build something like this here, a Capana 1. This is a giant rotating cylinder space station with a diameter of 500 meters and a length of 325 meters. But why this weird shape? Because that shape, being wider than long, would make it stable for rotation, greatly minimizing the tennis racket or a Johnny Bakoff effect, which we mentioned in our last video. 
so that the space station wouldn't wobble around. It would spin at 1.89 rotations per minute to give the feeling of 1G surface acceleration. It could hold a population of 3,000 people and would offer an interior living space of 510,508 square meters or a bit more than half a square kilometer. So with such a size, an interstellar voyage could be done, even should it take 50 years to Alpha Centauri. We would combine such a space station with the Project Daedalus design, which we discussed before. So Capanna 1 would get a large fusion reactor and deuterium and helium-3 fuel tanks. Deuterium is plenty for on Earth and can be obtained from regular seawater. 0.02 to 0.03% of the water mass on Earth is deuterium. Since the oceans on Earth weigh 1.32 times 10 to the power of 18 metric tons, which would yield 2.64 times 10 to the power of 16 metric tons of deuterium, we will not run into a deuterium fuel shortage anytime soon. As for helium-3, we will be able to harvest it on the Moon. There is an estimated 2,469,000 metric tons of helium-3 on the Moon in the lunar regolith. Of course, other forms of fusion reactors are also conceivable. The most important thing is just that the fusion is aneutronic, which means that no neutrons are created as products of the fusion reaction. Because neutrons extract too much kinetic energy, and therefore the maximum exhaust velocity could not reach 0.1 to 0.12 c if neutrons would be created. Also, high-energy neutrons could be really bad for the crew on board, and thick shielding would be required to keep the neutrons from harming the passengers. So okay, a huge rotating Kalpana 1 colony ship with 3000 colonists on board, and a huge aneutronic fusion reactor and huge fuel tanks. Of course, this would also need some form of shielding. We would put a big protection plate in front of the ship in order to protect from radiation and small micrometeorites. Also, as in the case of Project Daedalus, we would suggest creating a protection shield 200 km in front of the colony ship that would disperse small incoming debris or gas clouds. And then after this huge ship would leave Earth, it would arrive at Proxima or Alpha Centauri 40 to 50 years later and a generation of people would arrive which only know Earth from stories, as they would have been born on this interstellar starship. Of course, we would also need quite a few shuttlecraft in order to then transport the colonists to the habitable target planet. With 3000 people, we could have our first interstellar colony. Now imagine many such colony ships leaving Earth towards all known habitable exoplanets in a radius of 30 light years. And thus humanity would slowly become an interstellar civilization. Of course, there is still the problem that you could not really call that an interstellar empire, since travel and communication between the colonies would be so insanely slow. In order to be able to have the federation of planets or similar things, we would certainly need faster than light travel. But this will be food for another episode. As always, we'd like to thank all the people that help us with the channel in one or the other way. These are Zabol Schiare, Michael Root, Jay Keegan, Stefan van der Feest, Another Space Nut, Frank Miko, Rich LV, Based Space Boris, MLLT, Warhawk, Lucky Green, and Centauri Sparrow. By the way, we organize everything for this channel here on our Discord server. So if you would also like to join the team, be sure to use the invite link in the video description below. And of course, we'd also like to thank all the people that support us via PayPal. You guys are great and we really appreciate your help a lot. So thanks as always for watching the JS Space Report. And then I would say, on to the future. <laughs>